Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to talking about the Detroit Mafia and getting that conversation started. I know many of you have been patiently waiting for me to get to Detroit and now your virtue has paid off. We have so much to talk about. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. The origin of Detroit's Mafia, or partnership, is rather complex. Honestly, given Detroit's history and the close-knit nature of what became the modern partnership, I can't say that I'm surprised. The term partnership comes from the fact that in Detroit there were several different factions that came together in a patchwork of a family that became the modern Detroit Mafia, and we'll be discussing those factions today. Let's begin our story at the very beginning of the 20th century. Detroit's economy was booming, and several Americans were moving to the city in search of their fortunes. This is also the era in which several Sicilians were leaving the old country in droves to come to America and make their fortunes. One of the cities by 1900 that had become increasingly popular for its production economy was Detroit, Michigan. And it is in Detroit that we begin our story with a 33-year-old wine manufacturer and seller, husband and father, Agostino Vitale. Vitale was well respected and made good money with his wine business in Terracina, Sicily. He had married his wife, Grazia Melgore, some ten years prior, and had gone on to have six children with her. His voyage to America was much riskier than the story of many immigrants with whom we're familiar. Usually the story starts with a teenager, or maybe a son of a merchant, or a very young adult who's single who comes to America to find his fortunes. But in Vitali's case, he was already married, he was already successful, and he already had a large family to look out for. But Detroit, and his uncle Vito Buffa, was calling him. Vitale left from Naples on April 3, 1901, and would arrive in New York City on April 19, 1901. He would then board a train headed to Detroit to join his uncle. Detroit sits right on the Canadian border, and if you've been watching this show, you already know why that becomes so important later. But if you're new to the show, you'll find out soon enough why that was so critical in the upcoming episodes about Detroit. Detroit was growing at an exceptional rate, and the success was about to burst out of the seams with the Ford Motor Company in a few years. But for right now, steel and ironworking were big businesses. Detroit was an extremely diverse city. Waves of immigrants had come at various times, and the city was filled with different faces, languages, and flavors. At this time, Detroit's Little Sicily had the second largest concentration of Sicilian immigrants in the United States, with New York, of course, being number one. It is reported that Vitale might have been part of the Mafia before coming to the United States, which seems likely. In the United States, however, he did not get into crime by way of thievery, murder, or extortion. Instead, he acted as an interceder for those who were victims of the aforementioned crimes. His rise to power came by a method more similar to the fictional character of Vito Corleone. When someone in the neighborhood was in trouble, Vitale would step in on their behalf and take care of the problem, whether this was through negotiation, payment, or favors. Vitale, in a sense, would purchase someone's debt, thus making the individual indebted to him. He also made a great living with his wine business. Many Sicilian immigrants, specifically and most exclusively from Terracini, would find work under Vitale. Thus, he grew as a Detroit boss. By October of 1904, Vitale had become a naturalized United States citizen and would continue to expand his businesses. At this time, there were several crews, groups, and factions being created all over the city, and not just of Italian origin. I would be remiss if I did not mention the Purple Gang, but because this Jewish gang was separate from the conversation we're having today, I will be covering the Purple Gang in their own episode. I would like to briefly give an introduction to the Janola family, also of Terracini, but not necessarily affiliated with Vitale. The Janola family, specifically brothers Antonino and Salvatore, are among the earliest known mafiosi leaders in Detroit. These Janolas were not the kind of genteel mobster breed like Vitale. In fact, they were just the opposite. The Janolas were their own organization, but, being from Terracini, would have definitely crossed paths and worked with the Vitales, but they were associates, not members of the Vitale organization. Agostino Vitale had too much of a reputation to be directly associated with a rough group like the Janolas. The Janolas were leaders of the Black Hand Extortion Group by 1910 and would expand into the East Side. So now that you're familiar with the Terracini side of the Detroit Sicilian Mafia, allow me to acquaint you with the Alcamo side. Alcamo Sicily was much larger than Terracini and was dense with Mafia activity. Pietro Mirabile would arrive in New York City at the age of 24 on September 20, 1902. Mirabile moved to Detroit and got his operation started immediately, in his case, with a fruit business. Mirabile was an intimidating man, standing at 5 foot 11, and in addition to being taller, Mirabile was also younger than Vitale, single and full of muscle. 
Like Vitale, Mirabile was likable and smart, but unlike Vitale, violence, intimidation, and physical strength were the names of the game for him. Mirabile would receive his naturalization within six months and would soon be wed to Mariana Cataldo, a widow, on February 15, 1905, the day after Valentine's Day. The couple would have two children, and Mirabile would expand his crew at a breakneck speed, whereas Vitale took a more gradual approach. Mirabile and his wife would return to Sicily to visit Mirabile's mother in autumn of 1905. The couple would remain in El Camo for two years. While there, he sent the message out to other mafiosi in the area that he would be glad to add them to his crew in Detroit, and several would take him up on this offer. There is a fourth faction you should know about originating from Salemi, Sicily, and these are the Caruso brothers, Giuseppe and Calogero, who arrived in Detroit in April of 1904 and October of 1905, respectively. These men would establish their mafia by completing favors for the less fortunate, like Vitale, and by the produce trade, like Mirabile, eventually earning enough money to open their own grocery store that served as the headquarters for the Caruso Mafia organization. The person I really want to focus on today is Calogero Caruso's nephew, Vito Adamo. Caruso paid for Adamo's passage into the United States. The 23-year-old Adamo arrived in New York City in May of 1907 before moving to Detroit. Adamo has historically been credited as the founder of the Detroit Partnership, and while he would go on to be pivotal, I believe that the characterization as founder is a little bit overblown. Adamo and his uncles were a legitimate contender for mafia ownership of the city, but they were not strong enough to make it on their own. In order to overthrow Vitali's crew, the Carusos and Adamo teamed up with Mirabile upon his return to the United States in November of 1907, making Pietro Mirabile the boss and Calogero Caruso the underboss of this coalition. By November 23, 1907, Detroit would be thrown into turmoil. While Agostino Vitale was playing cards with his two associates, Paolo Scaglioni and John Lynette, at a house party, his cousin Andrea Vitale would arrive and cause trouble. Andrea Vitale had been asking Agostino Vitale for money for some time so that he could return to Sicily and bring back his family. Agostino Vitale had refused his cousin's request each time. It is believed that Andrea's desperation is what Pietro Mirabile used as leverage to overthrow Agostino Vitale in the end. We'll talk about how all of that happened right now. That night, Andrea Vitale came into the party with a knife and stabbed all three men playing cards. This stabbing would prove to be fatal for Paolo Scaglione, who would die as a result of his injuries on November 26, 1907. John Lynette would survive with just a cosmetic flesh wound on his face. On November 27, 1907, Salvatore Leone, an associate of the Ginola brothers, would be shot and knocked unconscious, although he was thought to be dead, by Francesco and Salvatore Vitale, cousins of Andrea Vitale. It seems that all of this violence would be a coordinated attack against the Terracini faction of Detroit's Sicilian Mafia. Francesco and Salvatore Vitale were caught red-handed, and Leone would survive. Back on November 23, 1907, Agostino Vitale would be in critical condition after the attack by his cousin. Andrea had plunged the knife deep into his body, leaving a gaping wound all the way down his torso. Vitale would hold his intestines in place with one hand while he was trying to shoot his cousin with the other before collapsing. Andrea Vitale ran off and hid. He did not want to get caught. After all, he had somehow procured enough money for safe passage back to Sicily that Monday. Many assumed this passage back to the old country came by way of Mirabile in exchange for Andrea taking out his own cousin. Francesco and Salvatore Vitale's attack on Salvatore Leone may have also come by way of coercion from Mirabile. Andrea Vitale would not make it back to Sicily, though. He would be caught the same night of the attack and identified as the assailant. Thrown in jail, Andrea Vitale would later be convicted of the murder of Paolo Scaglione and sentenced to life imprisonment despite his failed claims of insanity. Although Agostino Vitale survived the deadly attack, he would not be able to continue on as boss of Detroit. With his largest rival out of the way, Pietro Mirabile was able to take control of the Detroit Mafia, it was not a clean transition, though, and the city remained riddled with enemies for him. Mirabile himself was an extortionist in a black hand group. He also dealt in real estate and worked as a saloon keeper. These darker sides of his personality and leadership style were hidden from the public, and he conducted himself as a more of a Vitale-style man of honor, even though he was anything but. Mirabile took control of the Detroit Mafia in 1907. With Vitale out of the way, Mirabile now had to contend with the Ginola brothers, as well as various other gangs, but for today, let's stay focused on the Sicilian mafias. One of the other interesting tidbits about Mirabile's life is that he was a founding member of the Holy Family Church in Detroit on December 7, 1907. In the meantime, the Caruso association with the Mirabile family remained. However, Vito Adamo broke out on his own, which is why many will have Adamo listed separately for Mirabile. But in fact, the two shared a common enemy with the Ginolas. Adamo and his brother Salvatore 
broke away from the Mirabile crew not long after they had taken leadership of the city. In 1908, Adamo's primary focus became taking out the Janolas and their Black Hand extortion group activities. The local merchants in the areas of Ford City and Wyandotte turned to Adamo for protection against the Black Hand crew. This consumed Adamo so much that he created his own White Hand Society in direct competition with the Black Hand extortion crew by the Janolas. The White Hand Society, under the Adamo brothers, and the Black Hand extortionists, under the Janola brothers, would go head-to-head -head for several years, from 1908 to 1913. Specifically through 1912 to 1913, the Janola brothers began moving into Adamo's territory of Wyandotte, and this caused a serious turf war. In that year, Adamo gang members were being killed left and right. Adamo would hide out in Detroit with Pietro Mirabile, and likely rely on Mirabile for manpower and resources as well. Again, this was not a clean break from Adamo and Mirabile, so there's still so much debate about who was really in control of Detroit at this time. Adamo was making headlines and going head-to-head -head with the Janolas, but Mirabile still seemed to be the man with the resources. So, was Mirabile or Adamo the boss of Detroit? I'm gonna go with yes. Back to the White Hand Society versus the Black Hands, Carlo Caleca of the Black Hands was shot in August of 1913. He would not die immediately of his injuries, and would accuse Vito Adamo and his associate Filippo Bucciolato of the attack. Caleca would later die from his injuries on August 8, 1913. Adamo and Bucciolato would be brought in and tried for murder. However, they were able to avoid charges because in October of 1913, Caleca's widow and another individual living in the Caleca home would testify that Caleca told them that he did not recognize Adamo or Bucciolato. In September of 1913, when the Janola brothers had been shooting back and forth with their rivals, an innocent bystander was seriously injured. The Janola brothers would be charged, then released. In November of 1913, Vito and Salvatore Adamo were arrested for the shooting of a former Detroit detective, Ferdinand Palma. Palma had actually been forced out of the Detroit police force back in 1905 because of his connection with the human trafficking ring. Despite that setback, Palma remained a useful Adamo ally. The Adamo brothers would be released after they explained that they were good friends with Palma. It is widely believed that the shooting of Palma was orchestrated by the Janola brothers to take out an important Adamo associate. As far as the fighting between the Adamos and the Janolas, the Janolas would ultimately win the day and be the victors. Around 5 p.m. on November 24, 1913, Vito and Salvatore Adamo had just finished up some work with Pietro Mirabile and began their walk home. A short distance ahead, cloaked in shadows and large coats, stood two assailants who pulled sawed-off shotguns from their jackets and fired on the Adamo brothers before fleeing the scene. The Adamos did not immediately die of their injuries. Vito would die on the way to St. Mary's Hospital, and Salvatore would die at St. Mary's Hospital half an hour later. Both brothers were buried on November 27, 1913, at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Detroit, Michigan. This double homicide seems to have been a revenge attack for the murder of Carlo Caleca. Following her husband's death, Vito Adamo's wife encouraged the White Handers, in association with Adamo's companion Filippo Bucciolato, to continue to take on the Janolas. And while the White Handers did continue this fight, the war was won by the Janolas, and soon the resistance would be squashed. The Mirabile faction as well would continue to push against the Janolas, but after a long battle that would finally end in 1914, Mirabile left and returned to Sicily. The Janolas had grown too powerful to withstand, forcing Mirabile out of headship and out of the country. The violent Janolas were in control of Detroit's underworld. Tony was boss, Salvatore was underboss. And it is in their brutal hands that we will have to leave the city until our next episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the origins of the Detroit Mafia. As I said before, I am well aware that there was so much crime going on all at the same time in Detroit, and that's going to be a pattern that continues through my coverage of Detroit, unfortunately, but I hope that it was clarifying for you, and I will do my best to cover as much of it as possible. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about the Detroit Partnership. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section and social media to let me know who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.